You're a wizard, Harry. Before the release of the first Harry Potter movie, skeptics predicted it would fail and considered it a pointless idea. How wrong they were. It's been 20 years, but Potter still has a huge fan base all over the world. So how did the creators of the films about the boy who lived manage to make them so atmospheric and engaging? What is the secret of a visual that hasn't become outdated at all over the years? Today on the About Movies channel, we'll tell you about how the magical world, which is still loved by millions of children and adults, was created. By the way, only real wizards see the subscription button and the bell under our video. So if you're not a muggle, we invite you to click on them to become part of the magical world of cinema. Subscribe and let's get started. Few people know, but initially, the film studio considered the option of filming in the form of an animated series or, in extreme cases, combining live footage and animated fragments in one film. But Rowling was categorically against it. She wanted ordinary, classic films with real people and not the effect of the uncanny valley. She wanted a movie with a good plot and not a retelling of four novels in an hour and a half. Fortunately, the studio agreed. Franchise screenwriter Steve Cloves recalled how he was very worried before the first meeting with Rowling because he didn't want the writer to think that he was going to destroy her offspring. In turn, Joan admitted that she was already in absentia, ready to hate him. However, the fears turned out to be unfounded. Everything was decided by chance. Cloves asked, Do you know who my favorite character in the book is? And Rowling was already preparing to hear Ron for the hundredth time. So you you know, love. everyone loves it. Who couldn't love Ron? And I thought, okay, you love Ron. And then I okay, said, and then you said... Uh, uh, Hermione. The answer was perfect. Rowling put too many personal traits into the image of Hermione, and such an unconscious declaration of love undoubtedly bribed her. Rowling immediately stated that she was aware that cinema and literature were different genres, so she demanded that the film adaptation correspond not so much to the written letters as to the spirit of the book. Inevitably, you had to depart from the strict storyline of the books. The books are simply too long to make yeah. into very faithful films. And um, I can think of many places where it's worked just beautifully. It's hard to believe, but the same person worked on the design of all the Harry Potter films. This unique world was created under the strict guidance of production designer Stuart Craig, who has received as many as 11 Oscar nominations over a 40-year career. Craig thought over the design of Hogwarts and other locations from scratch. The production designer worked closely with director Chris Columbus and J.K. Rowling. The writer advised Craig on everything. I was, I was around a lot earlier on. I wanted, them to, I wanted the Great Hall to look right. I wanted Diagon Alley to look right. You know, there were details that I saw so clearly in my mind. I knew I, could, I knew I could help. I knew I genuinely could help, and yeah. I could help them make it right for the readers. And I felt a huge um, protectiveness, I suppose, and loyalty yeah. to the readership. Yeah. Before filming began, Rowling gave Craig a map of Hogwarts with the approximate location of important locations. Craig's main principle when creating Harry Potter was create magic inspired by reality. He wanted the audience to believe that such a world could actually exist, and the production designer stuck to this principle throughout all eight movies. That's why the magical environment in Harry Potter looks a little mundane and everyday life is magical. Harry's early years, when he makes discoveries and learns something new, had to look believable. As much as possible in a world where snakes can talk, goblins run banks, and the most popular sport is flying broomsticks, I think this universe is so good precisely because magic exists in a world that is very similar to ours. Stuart Craig one of Rowling's conditions was the fact that the film should be shot in an English studio and in the UK setting. Her magical world has become a reality on screen at the site of the former Rolls-Royce factory where airplanes were made during World War II. However, it wasn't done without natural scenes. First of all, Craig took up the creation of Hogwarts, the main location of all the films. In the first layouts, he relied on descriptions from books, but later realized that he could draw inspiration from real-life places. According to the lore of the universe, this castle existed for approximately a thousand years, and the production designer narrowed down the search to this timeline. Of the real locations in the UK, only a few attractions fell under this criteria. 
Oxford, and Cambridge universities, as well as some Gothic cathedrals. Craig's team traveled to these locations to make the necessary sketches for the sets. It didn't end there. For example, Oxford University provided some of the premises from its buildings for the filming of Harry Potter. But Craig was inspired not only by Oxford. The production designer has repeatedly stated that when creating sketches, he took the architecture of Durham Cathedral and Alnwick Castle as a basis. On the territory of this castle, a scene with flying lessons on a broomstick was also filmed, but for filming Hogwarts itself from the outside. It was necessary to find a suitable place. Philosopher's Stone's budget was not enough to build its own territory, so the problem was approached from a creative side. All wide shots of Hogwarts were filmed using a handmade miniature, which was placed in a separate pavilion. This layout was used for all filming of the franchise except for the Deathly Hollows. For the last part, they already used computer graphics. Craig successfully mixed different eras. Medieval scenery was successfully combined with the English surroundings of the 60s and 70s, and not a single element of the world fell out of the picture. People in this world have magic and don't need technology. Therefore, the environment vaguely resembles England in the 50s of the last century. These films show an amazing world where people wear t-shirts and jeans, use technology from the 50s, and live in buildings built from the 13th to the 15th century. We are consciously inspired by different eras and collide them with each other. Stuart Craig By the way, there is a legend that all the food that can be seen in the dining room at Hogwarts was real. Like Chris Columbus, the director of the first two parts, wanted everything to look realistic so much that he carefully thought out the menu described in the books and ordered that the dishes be prepared exactly according to authentic recipes. A strange decision from an experienced director, considering that under the heat of spotlights, any fresh food will quickly become worthless. In subsequent films, again, according to legend, the food was still prepared according to authentic recipes and then frozen to make molds and cast copies from epoxy. What we do know for sure is that the slugs that Ron had spit out in the second installment of the franchise weren't real. Rupert Grint stated that the slugs vomiting was the most difficult scene to film in the second film. However, we must pay tribute to the decorators. They did everything so that the boy was not so disgusted. That was so fun because they had all these different flavors of slug slime. There was chocolate, there was lemon, there was orange, there was peppermint. All these different flavors. They made them taste really nice. And some of the actors were so fond of sweets that they constantly stole candy and snacks from the buffet and brought them in the pockets of their robes to the set. Of course, we're talking about Tom Felton. The robes had huge pockets. He once said in an interview, after the third film in my robe, these pockets were sewn up. Someone thinks that these are rumors, but I want to tell the truth. It was all true. Chris Columbus made the first two films more childish, and Stuart Craig had to adapt to his vision. But that all changed when Prisoner of Azkaban was directed by Alfonso Cuaron. With his arrival, the approach of scenery has changed a lot. The production designer was given carte blanche to rework the design. The lighting changed a lot, and the interior of Hogwarts changed almost completely. Stuart Craig admitted that he didn't quite like the design he came up with for the first two parts, so he rethought his previous designs. Cozy Magic was replaced by Dark Fantasy, and almost all the changes were related to the mood of the scenery. Several times in the set of the first two parts, we wanted to change something, and thanks to Alfonso Cuaron, our director, we were allowed to change the design in some aspects. Hogwarts is still a magical place, and it will not be difficult to say, well, something is changing a little here. You look at something, and then the next time it will look different. For example, I think Hagrid's hut in Prisoner of Azkaban looks much different. The gloomy setting was one of the reasons why many viewers consider the Prisoner of Azkaban to be their favorite part of the Potter series. What about you? What is your favorite part of Harry Potter and why? Be sure to share your opinion in the comments. We read everything and like the most interesting comments. With the changes and the advent of new technologies came new creative solutions for decorations. One of Craig's favorite locations is Diagon Alley, which he called a separate character in the franchise. The production designer wanted Diagon Alley to look like it was frozen in time. Craig compared it to the environment from the novels of Charles Dickens. 
I took the image of London of the 17th and 18th centuries as a basis and drew part of the location based on the real streets of Brighton and York. Craig thought that some corners of the area should look semi-deserted and creepy. No, please. Harry! Hagrid! What do you think you're doing down here? Come on! Another location that he highlights in the series is the Room of Requirement. Craig chose the decorations for this room with his team. He visited dozens of rare furniture auctions and bought almost everything he could find. It took several months to collect things for filming. For eight films, the film crew built 588 sets. Only a few of them were used for the filming in parts. For example, among them was the Great Hall of Hogwarts, where all the ceremonial events of the school are held. Hello! How are you? Welcome to Gryffindor. As we mentioned earlier, Deathly Hollows already used computer graphics with might and main, and the work of Stuart Craig wasn't so noticeable in them. But it was thanks to the permanent production designer that the series retained its unique and magical look. In Harry Potter, magic comes naturally with compelling special effects. For example, moving stairs were created using a combination of real scenery and CGI. On the set of all parts, the actors climbed the same moving staircase that the engineers built for the first film, and then different computer models of this staircase were combined against a blue screen in one frame. This created the illusion that in Hogwarts all the stairs move at the same time. However, it was much easier to make live portraits. Within the framework where the paintings were hung, there was a blue fabric on which the necessary video clips were inserted during post-production. Most of the portraits and the large parts were drawn from scratch without the use of blue screens. By the way, people in the portraits were played by non-professional actors and employees and producers of Warner Brothers, so they wanted to expose themselves in the franchise. They did almost the same with live photographs and newspapers. There are also video clips inserted in post-production. However, there they used a green screen on paper and various filters to age the picture. But the door on the secret room is not computer graphics. It really exists. It's completely mechanical, however, its functionality is very gentle. Therefore, on tours of the Warner Brothers facility in London, it's very rarely shown in action. Speaking of the Chamber of Secrets, sometimes too realistic scenery didn't play into the hands of the actors. There is a scene in the second movie where Harry finds Ginny unconscious in the Chamber of Secrets. The floor on which actress Bonnie Wright had to lie was marble and just icy. The poor girl could hardly stand the shooting of this scene. Therefore, at some point, the team began to put bottles of warm water under the actress's clothes to warm her up. The green screen was superimposed not only on static but also on moving objects. For example, hands. In Half-Blood Prince, there is a scene in the library where the books from Hermione's hands were turned to the shelves by themselves. The secret of this scene is pretty obvious. Emma Watson gave books to people who were behind bookshelves. They put on their hands a special green cloth that was cleaned using a computer. Okay, sorry. On the green screen, the enemies that the heroes had to fight were also drawn. High-tech, multi-million dollar production that, that we are. Um, the Snake's Double was a pole with a boxing glove tied to the end. And Greg Powell, who's a stunt coordinator on Potter, and he's a bit of a legend within the industry, he uh, was on the other end. And it was all fine, and we were doing well, so I'm trying to parry the glove pole snake away. By the way, with this stick, Radcliffe got hit in the face a couple of times and even walked with swollen lips for one day. CGI sometimes completely replaced the practical effects of the first installments. Initially, the candles in Philosopher's Stone were real. They hung on cables from the ceiling, which was then removed using a computer. But on the set, it turned out that this was not safe. Candles often fell on tables, and their fire burned cables. In the following parts, they were replaced with digital models. One of the most difficult things to implement was the scenes with flying on broomsticks. That's why the Quidditch match wasn't filmed in the first movie, mostly because the special effects department couldn't figure out how to do it best. In most cases, the actors had to be filmed one at a time in separate studios, where they had to sit on a giant mechanism with a broom for several hours in front of a green screen. But in some joint scenes, several actors were filmed. A special computer program was responsible for the movement of the broom, which simulated flight in the air. The pavilion also had a giant fan that created the effect of wind. 
Shooting a single Quidditch match could take several weeks due to the complex production. For broomstick tricks, the mechanism could turn 360 degrees, and for some scenes, the actors had to jump to perform pirouettes in the air. On set, you are 9 meters above the ground. I was sitting on the broom while they threw balls at me, and it's pretty scary. Rupert Grint Computer graphics were also used on the actors in those cases when the usual makeup was not enough for the image. Ray Fiennes, who played the role of Voldemort, appeared on the set with special markers on his face. Thanks to them, his nose was removed in post-production, and other cases were the work of makeup artists. <laughs> Hagrid was another character that was partially created using CGI. Robbie Coltrane played this role in all films, but in those scenes where it was impossible to create the illusion of his greater growth and massiveness with the help of camera angles, doubles were used. They put on a mask with the face of Coltrane, and later, the film crew combined scenes with an understudy and the actor. Most of the special effects were needed for the second Deathly Hallows. Most of the film was devoted to a large-scale battle at Hogwarts, almost completely drawn on a computer. Green screen pavilions were used for making the last movie. Some of the destroyed scenery was real, but all the scenes with explosions depicted digital scans of Hogwarts. The development of the special effects industry greatly helped the creators of the Harry Potter films to realize their ideas and show the audience the magical world in all its glory. Make it the way J.K. Rowling imagined it to be. It is unlikely that the same scene of the battle for Hogwarts could be filmed without the use of a green screen. Due to the lack of high-quality technologies for creating special effects, at one time studios failed to film superhero comics. Films that could capture the spirit of the stories about the heroes that we love so much began to appear only at the end of the 90s. Stan Lee, Alan Moore, and other comic book writers have had to wait for much longer than J.K. Rowling to have their characters come to life on screen. If you click on this icon, you will learn about the long and thorny history of comic book movies. How did they turn from this into this? Follow the link and watch. And that's all for today. Like this video and stay with About Movies. There are more videos to come. See you soon. Bye-bye.